Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give people a few minutes to join. Um, if you would like to um, type in the chat where you're watching from, that would be great. And we'll get started in just a minute. All right. Well, welcome everyone who's joined so far. Um, my name is Sally Thurston from the Maynard Library, and we will get started in just a minute. We'll let some, a few more people join in. All right, should we get started? Sure. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Sally Thurston from the Maynard Public Library. Um, it's nice to have you all with us tonight. Um, welcome especially to everyone from the Ashland, Belmont and Holbrook libraries. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, I was saying to Melanie earlier, one nice thing that came out of COVID is that libraries figured out how to share programs and Zoom allows that and it just enriches everybody's programming. Um, so one technical um, one technical thing about asking questions after Melanie uh, does her talk and, and reading, um, she would love to take questions and have conversations. So um, you are welcome to type your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, or if you'd like to raise your hand, uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, that's fine too. And we'll um, open up the mics and let you speak directly. That's a little more personal and a little more fun. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, we're delighted tonight to have Melanie Brooks with us. Um, and one quick thank you to uh, to Larry, a uh, Maynard patron. He suggested having Melanie um, speak here tonight. Um, they appeared together on a panel back in 2017 at the Concord Festival of Authors. So thank you, Larry, appreciate it. Um, we always like suggestions of um, authors to bring in. Um, thanks also to the Silver Unicorn Bookstore. Uh, they're handling our online book sales tonight. Um, and um, it's in the chat now, but I will um, put both of the links, links to both of Melanie's books in the, in the chat. So watch for that. And it will be in the follow-up email as well. Okay, um, Melanie Brooks is here with us tonight. She's the author of the memoir, A Hard Silence, One, Daughter's, One Daughter Remaps Family Grief and Faith When AIDS, HIV AIDS Changes It All. Um, and she's also the author of Writing Hard Stories, Celebrated Memoirists Who Shape, Shaped Art from Trauma. Uh, she teaches creative nonfiction in the MFA program at Bay Path University and in the F MFA program at Western Connecticut State University and professional writing at Northeastern. You're a very busy woman. <laughs> um, uh, where did I leave off? Uh, she holds an MFA in creative nonfiction from the University of Southern Maine Stone, Stone Coast Writing Program and a certificate in narrative medicine from Columbia University. She's had numerous interviews and essays published on topics ranging from loss and grief to parenting and aging, published in the Boston Globe, Huff Post. Yankee Magazine, Psychology Today, The Washington Post, Ms. Magazine, Creative Nonfiction, and other notable publications. So Melanie, welcome to you. I'm gonna spotlight you and, um, and disappear here. Um, so let's do this. There we go. And I'll hand off to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sally. And thank you to my friend, Larry Kerpelman, for recommending me to you as well. I appreciate the support. Um, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about my new memoir. I'm going to read from it a bit and talk to you about the process of how that book came to be. And then I really want to open it up to conversation with you all. And um, I'm open to answering and talking about anything and everything um, related to this book. So um, my book is called A Hard Silence. And to just give you kind of the backdrop of this story, in 1985, my father was infected with HIV after undergoing a blood transfusion during, after undergoing open heart surgery and receiving a blood transfusion. And so it was 1985, for those of you who are old enough to remember the start of the AIDS crisis, it was a time of misinformation, of fear, of stigma, of ostracization of people who were infected with HIV. My father was a surgeon and he, like most other doctors and people who were observing this disease, knew very little about it. And he anticipated that he would be dead within months. And so wanting to avoid any kind of risk for our family or ostracism for our family, he decided that his illness would be a secret. We were living in Canada at the time and the public health laws in Canada were very strict and there was talk of quarantine families and victims and their families. And so he really wanted to protect us from that. And like I said, anticipating that he only had months to live, but he ended up living for 10 more years. And so from the time that I was 13 until I was 23, we carried this silence about his illness and this catastrophe that had happened to our family. Um, my dad ended his surgical career at that point. He never went back because he feared infecting his patients. And I watched him over that period of time fade beneath the weight of the stigma of this disease. And so this is really a story about interrogating silence and interrogating the impact of not being able to truly speak when we're experiencing pain and suffering. And so um, I'm going to read to you from the book a little bit and give you a, a little taste of it and then talk to you about how it came to be. One thing that I always like to make clear is that six months before my dad died in 1995, he and my mother published a book and revealed the secret of his HIV. So that's not what this story is about. It's not about revealing the secret. That was already known before my dad died. So I always like to kind of make that clear. But I'm going to read to you a little bit just to kind of give you a sense of what that silence was like for me at that particular time in my life. So not only were we not talking to not talking about it to people outside of our family, we weren't really talking about it inside of our family either. I have three brothers. And when my parents found out, they didn't tell my youngest brother, who was eight years old at the time. And they decided to keep that from him. And for seven of those 10 years, he didn't know about my dad's HIV status. And and so the silence was within our family as well. So we couldn't sit around the table and kind of talk about what was happening or ask questions. And so like most people at the time, my education about HIV and AIDS was happening through the media, what I was seeing on television, what I was seeing um, in news reports and magazines, that's where I was getting the information about what was happening to my dad and what might potentially happen to my dad. And that's what this chapter that I'm going to read to you tonight is about. It's called The Ryan White Story and Mine. How were the Taylor kids last night? Mom asked. Okay, I said, a little rambunctious, hard to settle them down for bed. I yawned. Even though I'd slept in a bit th this morning, instead of getting up to catch the bus, I felt wiped after arriving home past 11 the night before. I usually didn't babysit on weeknights. It was my junior year of high school, and I rarely stayed up that late. But my parents made an exception for our family friends. And since it was Monday, my homework hadn't piled up yet. I stared out the passenger window at the high bank of snow lying, lining the road. 
The morning light glistened on its ice-crusted surface. Discarded Christmas trees sat atop the mounds at the ends of many of the neighborhood driveways. The crenellated grooves left behind by the plow crunched beneath the car tires as mum turned onto Hazeldean Road toward my high school. I watched our breath exhale in puffs of fog as the heater worked to warm the air. I held my hands over the vents to keep my fingers from freezing. I was done with winter now that the holidays were over, now that 1989 was fully rung in. And though it was only the middle of January, I was ready for spring. I yawned again. It wasn't the umpteen games of go fish and hungry hippos that wore me out. It wasn't filling the outlines of puppies and fairy princesses with bright Crayola colors in thick coloring books and adorning them with glittery stickers or reading multiple bedtime stories from large picture books. It was what came after I'd tucked the kids into bed. I'd flop down on the couch in front of the TV Wrapped in a plaid blanket, I flipped between MacGyver and Kate and Allie before settling in to watch the ABC movie of the week. As John Mellencamp's voice belted small town, the screen filled with snapshots of an Indiana landscape, churches, factories, parks, schools. The Ryan White story. How did I know that name? I couldn't remember. It came to me 15 minutes into the movie when the mom from Who's the Boss, now playing Ryan's mother, sat in a hospital conference room and listened to her son's doctor telling her that the recurring infection in Ryan's lungs was likely caused by a blood virus. He was the kid on the news, posing in pictures with Michael Jackson and Elton John whose face I'd seen on the cover of People magazine last year. The kid with AIDS. I wondered if my mother knew about him. Had she followed his story? Ryan White caught the nation's attention in 1986, only a few months after dad learned of his HIV infection. Ryan, a person with hemophilia, contracted HIV from contaminated blood too. Did she know how people treated him when they found out he was infected? His small town community of neighbors and friends, terrified by a disease no one understood, had turned against this 13-year-old boy and tried to keep him out of school, far away from their children. They'd attacked his family. In one scene, Ryan's younger sister was bullied on a bus. My brother says your brother's a faggot a girl yelled. In another, set at the factory where Ryan's mother worked, a fight erupted between two workers after his mother poured coffee from a communal pot. When she assured one of the men that she didn't have AIDS and that he couldn't catch it from her, he spat back, yeah, how do you know? As I watched, a ticker tape of questions spiraled through my head. Was it the fear of these sorts of reactions that compelled my parents to keep dad's infection a secret? Could that happen to us here? Alone in my neighbor's house, I wanted to punch the off button on the remote, get up off the couch and disconnect from this movie. I wanted to pretend that what was happening to Ryan White, the community outrage, the isolation, the, dis the disease, had nothing to do with my family. Pretending was easy. Dad didn't look sick. He was strong and energetic. A doctor who got up each morning, put on a suit, and went to work as a medical advisor in an office building in downtown Ottawa. He mowed the lawn and weeded the garden on weekends. He skied and ice skated and swam and boated. He took Bailey, our golden retriever, on long walks every day. There was nothing in his manner that suggested he was different from anyone else. As far as I knew, apart from some days when he was especially tired, he was healthy. In the movie, the actor who portrayed Ryan White, 
the same wide-eyed, big-eared kid who'd played that Amish boy in the movie Witness with Harrison Ford was pale and thin and sickly. He struggled to breathe and spent days in the hospital with active infection. That wasn't dad. But as I watched the truth of AIDS play out in vivid cinematic detail on the screen, a new awareness funneled into my consciousness. Not yet. I sat motionless, the blanket pulled tight against my body. I couldn't stop watching. My fists clenched against my lips, blocking the air. How would the story end? A made-for-TV movie had a happy ending. Ryan's family moved on to a new community where they found acceptance and tolerance. The final scene showed Ryan arriving at his new, new high school with newspaper photographers, cameras flashing. The principal shook his hand saying, we're happy to have you. He led Ryan to a crowd of stranger, of students who walked him toward the school building. Hope broke across his mother's face as she watched. Waving and smiling, she drove away to the catchy beat of Elton John's I'm Still Standing. I turned off the TV then and stared into the empty screen. A fresh dread squeezed my insides. I knew Ryan's story was not over. The dying part just hadn't happened yet. At home, I climbed into bed, curled into a ball, my knees once again hugged to my chest and burrowed beneath my duvet. I couldn't stop thinking about what I'd watched. All these things didn't feel like they were supposed to belong in my world. The terrible accusations and assumptions about how Ryan had contracted HIV. Hatred from both strangers and people who'd known him his whole life people who treated him like the disease was his fault. His family lost their privacy and with it, security, something they'd always taken for granted. But the worst were the moments when Ryan was so sick he couldn't lift his head from the edge of the toilet seat. Hidden under my covers, the boating presence I'd felt with me ever since we moved from New Brunswick seemed so much bigger. A pressing question hammered against my skull. What's next? What's next? What's next? This question hung on my tongue the next morning in the car on our way to school. I glanced at mum. Her short brown permed hair was still a bit damp from her shower and the moose crusted curls needed to be brushed out. Her face was smooth even without makeup. She, she steered the car down Abbey Hill Drive, approaching the entrance to the school. I drew in a shaky breath, held it, and then blurted, is dad going to die? It came out as a question, but I was not asking. The answer had been there all along. I just needed to hear it. The car slowed, surprise registered on mom's face. She opened her mouth to speak and then closed it, her lips pressed together. My question was a cavern between us. Mel, she began, and I could already sense in her tone that she was about to downplay, deflect, or reassure the same way she downplayed, deflected, or reassured any time I got brave enough to ask questions about dad's illness. Just tell me. My voice was steady, but the plea behind the words made it sharp. We approached the school. Cars crowded the rectangular parking lot out front and students stood in clusters on the snow-packed sidewalk by the main entrance, backpacks tossed over their shoulders, their coats pulled close against the cold. Near the glass doors leading into the school, I saw my friends, Penny, John, Russell, Sunita, they were waiting for me before heading inside. Tell me, I said again, this time less steady as mom pulled up against the curb and turned in her seat toward me. Is dad 
going to die. I turned to and faced her directly. My eyes locked on hers. She gripped the steering wheel with her gloved hands and inhaled a measured breath. Then, speaking in a defeated voice I'd never heard before, she said, yes. The single word ripped through the protective blanket that she'd wrapped around me for the last four years. It tracked into my mind, sinking like a stone to the ocean floor, where it settled for good. Okay. I stretched from my backpack on the floor and clutched the door handle. Okay, I said again. I pushed the door open and climbed out into the frigid air, welcoming it into my lungs. I walked toward my friends, plastered a smile on my face, and shoved everything else back down. Just before I entered the school, I looked back toward the car and lifted my hand to wave. Mom still gripped the wheel, her gaze trained on me. She waved back and tried to smile, but tears traced lines down her cheeks. She put the car into gear and drove away. So this book began in 2013 and published in 2023. So it was a project that took me a decade to finish. I wasn't writing it that whole time. And I actually wrote another book in between, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But it was a 10 year labor to bring this book into the world. And it's kind of ironic because we lived that secret for 10 years. So unpacking it and putting it into the pages of the book took the same amount of time. So I, my parents published that book in 1995. The secret was out. There was no longer a need for the silence around my dad's illness. But when they published their book, I had gotten married and moved a thousand miles away. And so I was not there for the big reveal. And so to me, the changed rules didn't really matter. And I kept that story and that silence about it very close for almost 20 more years. And I kind of lived through the grief of losing my dad and I kind of moved on with life. But what happened was I was kind of carrying the weight of that story with me for that 20 year period after his death. And it started to become heavier and heavier and eventually became so heavy that I had to figure out a way to put it down. And so that's when I decided that I would think about writing this story. And so I thought, you know, the best way for me to do that would be to be part of a writing community. And so I enrolled in a Master's of Fine Arts program in 2013, thinking I knew what I was going to, going to be write, writing about. My dad had been dead for almost 20 years. I thought I had coped with the grief of that. I thought I understood the story that I was going to tell. But within days of kind of starting the work, I recognized I had no idea what I was really doing. And I had no idea what the story actually was. And I started peeling back these layers of memory. And what began happening as I did that was kind of all of that unresolved trauma, all of that unresolved grief began bubbling to the surface. I had contained it in that box I was carrying with me, but when I started to look at these memories, it began to leak out. And so I was really caught off guard by the psychological impact that it had on me. I wasn't expecting that. I really thought I had a handle on it. Fortuitously, at the same time that I started my MFA program, I also started therapy. Ironically, I didn't start therapy to talk about this story at all. I had started it for another reason completely, but it turned out to be a really positive thing that I was in therapy at the same time that I was unpacking these memories because I was able to start kind of processing some of that grief and that trauma. But as I sat to try to write this book, there would be moments when I would be sitting in front of my computer and I literally would feel like if I type one more word, I'm going to literally disintegrate. I'm gonna just disappear. 
it felt that difficult. And so I started wondering as I was kind of working through this trauma of my own and, you know, feeling the psychological impact of digging into this story, I started thinking, you know, how do other writers do this? As part of my MFA program, I had to read a lot of other books and I was reading memoirs and I was specifically choosing memoirs about hard topics, about, you know, loss and grief and family dysfunction. And I started thinking, you know, how did this writer write about the death of her child? You know, how did this writer write about, you know, witnessing and observing this long-term illness of his partner before his death? How did this writer write about this horrific abuse she experienced at the hands of her father? And I kept thinking, how did any of these writers survive? And I started looking for you know, kind of material articles about kind of that psychological journey, and I couldn't find any. And so as part of my MFA program, I had to write kind of this third semester project. And, and it was, you know, my creative thesis that I was working on the whole time was my memoir. But for this third semester project, we had to do more of a kind of a critical analytical piece. And so I thought, well, maybe I could write an article on the psychological journey of you know, writing traumatic stories. And I thought, you know, I'll write, I'll reach out to a few of these writers whose books I'd been reading, and maybe they would consider, you know, answering a few questions for me, and I could write this article. But what ended up happening was every writer that I approached, not only responded, but they said, yes, I'll answer your questions, but why don't you come to my house and we'll have a conversation or let's go out to dinner together or let's meet here. And I began to have all of these beautiful experiences of going and speaking with these writers. And I realized that I couldn't just kind of take these experiences and turn them into like a couple of quotes in an article. So I just began writing them up as profiles of these conversations. And I had a mentor at the time who kept saying to me, every time I would turn in one of these profiles, she kept saying, you know, you're writing a book. And I was very resistant to that because first of all, it had started as a very selfish endeavor. I was doing it all for myself, you know, and also I was already writing the book, the memoir. But as these, as I was having more of these conversations and I was, you know, learning more from these writers, I realized that if somebody had given me their words at the beginning of my process, it would have been so helpful to me. And so when I graduated from my MFA program, I had about two thirds of my memoir written and I had, you know, I think I had done 10 or 11 of these interviews. So I kind of had these two projects and I decided to pursue the interview project first, which ended up becoming my first book, which is called Writing Hard Stories, um, Celebrated Memoirists Who Shaped Art from Trauma. And I ended up, in the end, I ended up interviewing 18 contemporary memoirists and talking to them about their process to bring their stories to the page and then put them out into the world. And each time I spoke to them with every interview, it gave me a little bit more courage, a little bit more strength, a little bit more oxygen to breathe, to go back and work on my own story. And so that was kind of the gate that I had to go through in order to get to the, the part of writing this book and being able to finish this book, because they kept reassuring me. They kept saying things like, first of all, there's gonna come a time where it doesn't feel so hard to write these memories. And then they said, there's going to come a time where you're going to recognize that there's something more than just your story in these pages. And I talk about this to memoir writers or would-be memoir, memoir writers all the time, that we all sort of begin because, not because we're thinking we want to publish a book, but because we've had this experience and we want to try to figure out what actually happened. We want to try to process and understand that experience. Some people kind of stop there and say, you know, I figured it out and they put it away and they move on to something else. But those of us who move into the realm of thinking, now I'm gonna think about publishing this book, it's because we've discovered something in the process of writing that is more universal 
And so for me, what I recognized was that though my family circumstances are particularly unique, the idea of suffering in silence isn't. I'm sure everybody who's here tonight can speak of an experience where they've had to say, stay silent about something painful, right? Family secrets are not unique to my family. We've all had to keep some kind of family secret or experience some kind of family secret. And so I recognized that there was that kind of universal thread that would be relatable for readers. And that's what kind of compelled me to put it out into the world. And I also thought that maybe if I speak about the thing that for so long had been unspeakable, it might encourage somebody else who is still feeling like they have to carry their story in silence to maybe start speaking about it. And that was kind of my hope in writing this book. And since, you know, since writing it, I feel like I've, you know, in all the conversations that I've been able to have since writing it and going out on book tour with it, I feel like it's done just that. It's opened space for other people to lean into with their own stories. And it's given them permission to kind of talk about the things that maybe they hadn't been able to talk about before. You know, the writers in Writing Hard Stories, I talk about them as being companions to me along the way. And my hope with A Hard Silence was maybe my story and my story of getting this story out could be a companion for others who are working through their own hard stories. And that's that's where that kind of came to be. And that's kind of the story behind this book. So I'd love to spend the rest of our time just talking and answering questions and conversing about things. So I'm curious if you all have things that you can relate to, if you have questions about the story itself, I'm happy to answer anything about it. So please feel free to ask. All right, so um, like I said before, uh, feel free to type your questions in the chat, or if you'd like to speak directly to Melanie, um, raise your hand and we'll have you unmute. Um, so I have a question, Melanie. Sure. Um, what and um, I've heard Andre Debus talk on about this, yeah, um, specifically when he was writing Townie. Um, but what? How did you see your responsibility to your family members? Yeah. Um, you know, your mother and the decisions that she made, and um, and how you portray your brothers and their reactions to well family. it was you know it was my interview with andre for writing hard stories that was actually really helpful for me and i know he said that said this in other places as well but he talks about he talks about the fact that kind of the decision he made in terms of um how he was going to integrate you know his family into his own memoir was he was only going to write about them in so much as their experience intersected with his, right? And he gives the example about, you know, his brother was having an affair with a teacher and that he, there were moments where he was, you know, walking down the hallway and he could hear the sounds on the other side of the door. And he said, you know, me in that hallway and those sounds, that's my story. But whatever is happening on the other side of that door, that's his story. And so I really followed kind of that advice in terms of the things that I decided to write about with my family members, my three brothers and my mom particularly, I decided that I would only write about them insofar as our experiences intersected. Because it's really important when it comes to memoir to claim your story in the family story, right? I don't have to write everybody else's story. I just have to write my story. And my my story is what happened to me when HIV happened to my dad, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was very intentional and very careful with how I handled writing about them on the page. 
there are things I had to write about because they impacted my story. And some of those mm -hmm. things were a little bit difficult, right? And I also had to write about things where our experiences intersected, you know, the scenes of my dad dying, scenes of you know other painful scenes that I knew would be hard for them to experience on the page. But I also knew they had to be part of the story mm -hmm. for it to be complete. Um, so um, were, was your family supportive of this process? They were supportive of the writing process. They knew I was writing about it when I was doing my MFA. I always say that I think that what they anticipated was that maybe I was taking my parents' book and just making myself a bigger character. Mm. <laughs> I don't think they quite expected or knew what it was that I was writing. And I was pretty purposeful about not asking for their input when I was writing. And part of that was because I am the only daughter. My three brothers are all very strong personalities. They're all type A, two of them are doctors. One of them is the president of a global relief organization. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, they're not people whose opinions it's easy to push back against. And <laughs> so I kind of recognize that if I let them, um, if I let them, you know, kind of influence my memories as I was trying to unpack those memories, I'd bend to, mm -hmm. to their thoughts, to their ideas. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make sure I was writing this story from my own memories. And so then what I decided was that unless this book was going to be published, I wasn't going to share it with them. And that wasn't because I was hiding anything from them. It was more just because I knew that there would be material in it that would be hard for them to read. It'd be particularly hard for my mom to read mm -hmm. about you know, painful experiences I had had that she didn't know about. It would be hard for her to read about you know, my dad dying again and you know, reliving those experiences. So I wanted to be sure that unless it was going to be made public, that they didn't have to experience that. And so that was kind of my process along the way. So they've been very supportive of the writing process. Mm -hmm. It's not easy for anybody to be written about, you know, mm -hmm. no matter how careful you are, how, you know, how much time and intention you take. And so I know that it's been tough on them to just kind of see themselves represented through my lenses, you know? I know for my mom, her biggest fear is that people are going to read this book and feel like she was a bad mother because she didn't know how much I was carrying, you know? And I, mm -hmm. and I say this all the time that I know if I had gone to my mom, if I had gone to my dad and I had said, I'm struggling, I need help, they would have given it. I have no doubt about that. But I didn't do that. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't go to them. And I was very good at pretending I was okay when I wasn't okay. And so there's no blame at all for my mom. And I think people will read this and recognize that she was working under impossible circumstances. You know, she was my dad's sole confidant and she was, you know, his biggest support. And she was trying to raise four children at the same time, you know, and trying to keep our lives as normal as possible in circumstances that were anything but. And so I continuously reassure her that, you know, people aren't going to read that and think you're a bad mother, you know, they're going to read that and be understanding of what it was you were facing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Stan has uh, a comment and a question. Uh, sure. Thank you for your story and your talk tonight. Did you keep a journal during the 10 years of your dad's illness? I didn't. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a big journaler. I, there are times when I'll sit down and write something because it's kind of pressing at me, but I'm not somebody who keeps kind of a daily journal. And so a lot of people have asked me the question, you know, how do you remember so much? I am somebody who has an excellent memory and my memory plays like a movie in my head, you know? So the experiences that I went through during that time, those very pivotal experiences, they play like movies in my head. I can see those scenes. I can see those moments very vividly. And so I was able to bring that onto the page. Um, 
So Larry has his hand raised. I'm I'm gonna invite him to talk. Yes, please do, Larry. Go ahead, Larry. Unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, Melanie. Hi, nice. Larry. Nice to see you again. It's great to see. You. I can't see you, but it's great to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you. Yeah. Um, you wrote that uh, your youngest brother, um, because he was so much younger, was somewhat left out of the loop. Uh, yeah. purposely um and i wondered to what extent you feel that his response and reaction to everything was um was different if if it if it was at all sure well so just a little backstory so when my when my parents found out about my dad's hiv they sat down with my two older brothers so my two older brothers were 16 and 15. I was 13 and my youngest brother was eight. And they sat down with my two oldest brothers and told them right away. They chose not to tell me and they chose not to tell my younger brother. But somehow, and I write the words I use in the book are, it's a baffling hole in my memory. I knew within days of my dad learning of his infection, I knew he was HIV positive. And I don't know if it's because I overheard a conversation. It must have been, but I don't have a memory of that. And so I knew within days and it, and probably within a few weeks, it was understood that I, I knew. And so that that conversation never happened between me and my parents. So I kind of just, it just became an understanding between us that I knew. For my brother, for my younger brother, first of all, when I found out that my parents had finally told him, and he was 15 at the time, I felt like he should have known sooner, but none of us could kind of tell my dad when the right time was going to be to tell him. So when they finally did tell him, I was in college and I remember calling him and talking to him and his first words were, so much of my life makes sense now. So there was something in that experience, even though he didn't know what it was, he felt the experience as it was happening. And so when he read my book, it was interesting because he said so much of it like he hadn't experienced. And so it almost felt like he was reading somebody else's history because he hadn't been part of a lot of those experiences. Um, it's, it's in sort of the same vein, um, uh, your mother who, who I met at your, at your book launch, uh, she's yeah. a very gracious woman. Um, did, did you have a sense that uh, what 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 was your sense of her living through this as as she lived through it and as you lived through observing her or seeing her? I mean, I, I think what I what I recognize for her is she was she was carrying the bulk of the weight of this burden, you know, because she wasn't only you know, carrying my dad, my dad's pieces of it and being his primary caretaker and support. But she was also, you know, kind of carrying us along with that. And so I almost think about her as like the spine that was kind of holding us all up. And she wasn't, you know, it wasn't a visible thing that was happening, right? But it, she was, she was the one who was kind of keeping things together. And I, you know, I kind of came to, I, I, I talk about this in the book that I didn't know a lot of that. And I didn't know a lot of their experience until I had a chance to read a manuscript of their book. And that was when I was 21 years old, you know, so I, I didn't know so much of what they had endured because they kept that hidden from us. And so it was only after the fact that I really realized how much she was carrying on her own. Um, Jane has her hand raised. Great. Jane, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks so much. Uh, just curiously, uh, time-wise, uh, this afternoon there was a speaker on NPR who was speaking about the uh, 
the AIDS epidemic at the time and the tremendous, tremendous ostracization of people, uh, so much to the point that uh, churches wouldn't bury people who had died of AIDS. Right. And, and if they did, if they could convince somebody to do that, they would say they had cancer or um, a heart attack or, or something. They would not admit that. Did you, your family experience anything of that when your dad actually did pass? Well, first of all, at the time, it was pretty much mandated that anybody who died of AIDS had to be cremated. So that was that was the first thing in terms of the church. That's a big part of our story, um, because we were very involved in the evangelical Christian church. And it was the loud leadership and voices from that church that were responsible for so much of that stigma, you know, kind of declaring that AIDS was God's punishment for homosexuality. And, you know, it was his righteous judgment. And so, so much of that culture played into the stigma, but it also played into my family's silence, right? Because my father, his father was a Baptist minister. I think he was very afraid of what our Christian community and what their response would be. And so a lot of my story is also kind of digging in and interrogating those roots of stigma and kind of deconstructing and reckoning you know, my own faith story out of that. So we certainly, you know, within our own church community, we were hearing those stories. We were hearing that we were experiencing that intolerance and discrimination. That's so sad. It is so sad. I mean, it's, you know, you think about the communities that are supposed to be spreading love and acceptance, that they were responsible early on for some of the biggest pain. Right. The, the groups that should be supporting you. Exactly. Actually doing exactly. just the opposite. Yeah. Thank you. This has been such an, an enlightening and wonderful presentation. So thank well, you for thank that you. as well. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Elaine. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Elaine. I did. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Elaine. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about your father himself. You mentioned that he stopped being a surgeon after his diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So how, first of all, how did he explain that to the wider world? Yep. And then after that, what did he do having lost? That's a big part of his identity as being a surgeon. Yeah. So my dad was 42 when he had his heart attack. He was the only thoracic surgeon at that time. The specialty of surgery was um, very new as a singular specialty. And so he was one of the only thoracic surgeons in Canada, and he was the only one in the Canadian Maritimes. So he had a very thriving but very busy practice. And so when he had his heart attack, he his cardiologist told him that if he went back to surgery, he would likely have another heart attack that would kill him. And so he needed oh. to take a hiatus. So I didn't mention the fact that it it wasn't right away that my parents found out about my H my dad's HIV status. It was eight months post-surgery. So during that period, my dad made plans to take a medical advisor job across the country, and it was going to be a temporary pause from his surgery. He was going to get in better health. He was going to, you know, do all the things his cardiologist wanted him to do. And so that job as being a medical advisor um, for a large medical legal association in Canada, that was supposed to be a temporary job. 10 mm -hmm. days before the move was when they found out about my dad's HIV status. And so what was going to be a temporary um, pause in his career became a devastating loss of his career. And so that was a huge part of watching, you know, me bearing witness to my dad kind of disappearing before my eyes because he went from being this larger than life, you know, doctor and surgeon who 
whom everybody knew, you know, we lived in a small town in New Brunswick. I would tell people my name and they would immediately ask me if I was Dr. Messenger's daughter. And he had mm -hmm. you know, saved everybody in their family. <laughs> so, so, you know, whether it was exaggerated or not, that's how the stories always came to me, you know, so mm -hmm. went from being that to having lost all of that. And, you know, so long before the disease, the disease's physical effects, you know, made him fade away, his, his whole kind of being faded from um, just having lost so much because of the disease. Well, that's tremendously sad. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was thank awesome. You. Thank you. Okay, any, any more questions for Melanie? I think there's one from Stan. From Stan. Oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Hi, Melanie. Um, I've got a question. All right, so I, I read Hard Silence a few weeks ago, and I'm in the middle of writing hard stories right now, and what I'm picking up from writing hard stories is sort of the idea of, like how the memoir can be cathartic in this sort of situation. And I'm assuming you probably finished a while ago, but you know, yeah. this only came out to the public a few months ago. Right. So, you know, was, was it the, I guess, what was the biggest point of the cathartic effect for you? Was it when you finished or when you started or in the middle and how yeah. has that changed after it got published? So it was certainly very healing for me. Uh, my friend Marianne Leone, and if you're reading, I don't know if you've gotten to her chapter yet in writing hard stories. She talks about how she hates that word cathartic because it actually means to purge. And she is writing about her son who died. And she was like, I didn't want to purge my son from my life. But, you know, when I first started writing this book, I actually think I did want to purge this story from my life. I wanted, I thought I would write it, I'd put it down, I'd leave it somewhere on the road behind me. But what began to happen in the process of writing it for me was realizing this wasn't a story I wanted to let go of, because in the writing of it, I really recognized how much it had shaped who I was as an individual, how much it shaped kind of my outlook. And I realized that it wasn't a story I was gonna, going to let go. It was a story I was going to keep carrying with me, but I needed to learn to carry it differently. Like the way I had been carrying it before I wrote it, it was this heavy burden. Now it's in the pages of the, this book and I have control over that story. And so I think that the catharsis, you know, or the healing, has happened all the way through for me, you know, after kind of getting through that in, initial kind of psychological turmoil of writing it and realizing like I was going to keep going and I was going to do it. I, I kind of started to feel like what it, what it means to get it out of you. Right. And, and as I said before, you know, I was kind of in the middle of the therapeutic process too. And, you know, kind of, I was doing cognitive behavioral therapy, which is talk therapy. And the belief behind that is, you know, when you talk about the things that you're holding inside, it's better for you. Right. And, and in the same way, kind of writing about these things enabled me to get them out of me but then I was able to kind of reintegrate them in a different kind of way into my life. And so it's been healing. It, the writing process was healing, but also the process of going out with this book now written and published has been incredibly healing for me because I've had the chance to speak to audiences like you. And I've had the chance to tell this story that I was never allowed to tell, you know? And I've talked about this very often that, you know, for my whole life, I always felt like there was just this wall between me and other people because it was this story that I wasn't talking about that was keeping me from being authentic, being truly myself. And in writing this book, I've taken down that wall. And so I feel much more authentic in front of audiences. I feel more like myself. And so that's been a hugely healing scenario for me as well. Okay. 
I one second piece. Sure. Uh, Sue Silverman talked yes. about how after she published her story that she started getting hundreds of letters and things like that. Have you gotten sort of a response to and then you feel gratified that your story is helping others? I have. I have. I've gotten lo a lot of lovely responses, a lot of lovely notes. Um, it's really interesting to get the messages from people who know me, like a lot of my friends who have read the book, because, you know, I write about, since you've read the book, you know that I all, I don't just write about the past. I write about, you know, the near present, you know, as well. And so people who kind of knew me as I was unpacking this story and processing this story, you know, I think it's helped them to kind of understand me in a different way, you know, so, so I've gotten some really lovely responses from people on that level as well. And one of the things I haven't mentioned is that I write a lot about therapy in this book. Like I, I put my readers in the therapist's office with me. And that's very intentional because I wanted my readers to see how that processing worked for me. And also because I'm writing about a stigmatized illness, I, I, we know that mental health tends to have stigma attached to it. And so it felt important for me to not only just mention I was in therapy, but to show what that process looked like and share those private moments with the world, which is tough. <laughs> it is so, tough, for sure. Nice it work. Is. All thank right, you. I am all, all set. Thank you for your answers and thank you for your efforts tonight. Thanks for reading my books, Dan. Yeah. Uh, Elaine, did you have another question? Sorry, I said no, no more questions, just oh. tremendous admiration. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so, Melanie, I, I wonder um, if you feel or if if anyone in your family feels like this could have been handled differently now, looking back. Like, did do, does your mother feel like she didn't have any choices? I mean, given the um, your father's career and standing in the community and um, your your family's faith. I think that it's easy to kind of, in hindsight, imagine that things could have been different. I mean, I do believe that we probably more than ostracism would have received support, you know, because when my parents did end up writing their book, they received an outpouring of support, both from friends, you know, strangers, former patients of my dad's, you know, and, and it was this kind of amazing thing. And I, and I do wonder, I, I don't know that we can know the answer, but I sometimes wonder, had there not been some specific experiences that made my dad feel like revealing his secret would be detrimental because he did have some very specific moments where he shared and he was rejected. And I think that had those not happened, I think potentially they would have told the secret sooner. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to say, you know, I, I think, you know, my mother would say in hindsight, you know, knowing what we know now about therapy, we all would have been in therapy, you know, but back then that wasn't as normalized as it is now, you know? Yeah. I know for me, it's it has, as a mother, you know, I have two children, a 21 year old daughter and a 23 year old son. And, you know, kind of we learn generationally things that we want to do differently. And one of the things I learned out of this experience was that just because we're available to answer questions or to be there for our kids, they don't always know that. And so it was very important to me from kind of day one that my kids hear again and again and again the invitation that they can talk to me that if they're going through something that I'm here for them you know that felt very important to extend that invitation regularly and I continue to do that just so that they know you know because I think had I 
had I had the conversation with my parents about his, my dad's illness, I think they would have said that to me, you know, if you have questions, you can come to us at any time. But because I never had that conversation, I was the one person who didn't get that conversation. It always felt like I was carrying a secret that wasn't mine to carry. And so there was some kind of shame and guilt that, that sat with me in thinking about asking for help. Wow. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for sharing your story tonight. Um, it's been a, oh, okay. <laughs> it's been a um, um, powerful um, experience to, to hear your story. Thank and you. I encourage everyone to uh, go out and, and buy the books, both of them. Um, we do have copies of both in the library. So um, if you prefer to do that, um, I can help you find them. And I just put my website um, in the chat as well. If okay. anybody has follow up or would like to reach out to me, you can contact me through my website. Too. And I will share that in the email that, that uh, the follow up email from the talk. Yeah. Um, right. So I think this is a good place to stop. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I really appreciate it. And um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Sally. And thank you to the other libraries who joined as well. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.